Um, so, I'm going to talk uh, about the ultra endurance performance and, uh, and fatigue. So, I'm sure you are, at least uh, you have heard about ultra endurance, but you may not know exactly what we are talking about. So, a bit of introduction before I start talking about the um, more scientific uh, uh, data. Um, so, ultra endurance could be in different sports, and obviously, a distance you can study during those uh, ultra endurance even depends on the type of locomotion. And so, if you are we're talking about cycling, a typical, and I think the next presentation will be about that, uh, is a typical uh, ultra endurance event, and non endurance ultra endurance event is the race of cross American cycling. So, it's about 5,000 kilometers, in, and if you're very good, you should be able to do that in about a week, a bit more than a week, um, from west to east. In, in uh, triathlon, so you all of you know the Ironman. You may have heard that some people are doing two or three Ironman, and now they invited the DK Ironman, and now the next, the last one was the double DK Ironman. <coughs> so yeah, if you know what the Ironman, Ironman distance if you can count, I guess, yeah, it's basically 36 kilometers in the pool, swimming, <coughs> and uh, 3,000, basically a Tour de France in cycling, <laughs> except that you stay on the loop, you're not going in the Alps, and, uh, and then, of course, 20 marathons, so 800 kilometers still on the loop, not the same one, I guess, and if you're very good, you can do that in about uh, 20 days. Um, so you need to save your vacation to do that. <laughs> and if you have a more vacation, you can do this race. So this one, now we're talking about running. Uh, apparently not many people have a lot of vacation. <laughs> 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 now you have uh, 50 days to, to run the race, and it's 5,000 kilometers, but in running now. Um, so now not all ultra endurance events are as crazy as that. They are more basic ultra endurance, but we're talking about uh, running and my talk I will focus on running actually. Uh, basically an ultra endurance event could be anything above the marathon. Uh, that doesn't have to be on the road. There are many events on various environments like desert or in the cold. Of course there are also uh, races uh, on road, like the very known uh, Comrades Marathon. So this one is uh, 89 kilometers. 12,000 people running, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 12,000 people running uh, this race. So, yeah, ultra endurance is basically different distances, different environments, and different types of events. Could be a single stage, most of the events are single stage, um, but it could be also multi days uh, stages with or without rest during the night. Uh, a very typical one is a six day race in running or in hiking, but uh, in, in running it's uh, quite uh, not famous, but there are, there are many uh, races like that all over the world. Um, so yeah, six day running. And you may not know that, but actually this type of event is not uh, recent. You may have a recent race like the Trafalgar de Mont Blanc, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but this type of race, especially the six day race, they they had this kind of race uh, at the in the 19th century. Like people were running during six days in an indoor track, 250 meter track. Uh, so this is not new. Um, this is a comparison. So the first uh, kind of scientific data is a comparison that the Tim Noakes uh, published. Uh, of course, it's a rough evaluation of the energy expenditure of the different races. So here is the six day races in, in running I was talking about. So basically team evaluated the energy expenditure to 55,000 uh, kilocal, which is uh, much lower than the Tour de France. And the uh, race across America in cycling, we are at 180,000 kilocal. Now there is also the race across America in running, I think they, that, that was in the 30s, but they, they have this race again uh, either this year or next year, I'm not too sure. Uh, this is, uh, but this is almost nothing compared to probably one of the uh, most strenuous uh, endurance, or well, ultra endurance event, if you wish, which is the, uh, the, the Polar Expedition. And uh, Team Knox evaluated 
the energy expenditure to 1 million kilocal, which is about the same, probably, uh, I calculated that it was about the same energy expenditure as this guy had when he ran from Paris to Tokyo. Uh, so basically 20,000 kilometers in 260 days, and the energy expenditure was also about the same, probably the same uh, amount. So, going back to uh, more classic uh, experiment events in running, uh, you can see on this graph that the number of roads on road or track are not that high. This is in the US, but there are comparable data in Europe. Uh, however, on the contrary, the trail running rates are going up uh, exponentially. And this is the same again in Europe. <coughs> so we're going to focus on, uh, on that type of, uh, of race, uh, ultra trail uh, running. Um, so I have a short video in case you don't know what an ultra trail is. And the very typical ultra trail is the ultra trail du Mont Blanc. So I'm going to show you a short video to let you know how it looks like. French Alps for what is the best known ultra trail race in the world. The Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc for 10 years in a row. This has been where the best runners have met to dispute the pinnacle of trail running. 168 kilometers around the roof of Europe. And in 10 years, this has become incredibly popular. 6,000 entrants in this year's race. starting in Germany and ending in Germany, but it goes via Italy and Switzerland. And uh, the first good bit of the news is that the weather is perfect, unlike last year, where the course had to be shortened dramatically, so it will be run at the full 168 kilometre. Well, the bulk of the competitors are here simply to cross the finish line to see what they can do. Um, there's a very friendly atmosphere down on the start line, but it's a highly competitive race as well. So at 4.30 p.m. they start the 168 kilometer run. It's not the distance, it's the amount of climbing that they do on the way round that really makes this so different. 9,706 meters of ascent. This has become one of the great spectacles, not just in Chambly, but all around the Mont Blanc Massif. It's not about all about running, as you can say. There's lots of walking as well. Up hills, down hills, obviously. Days and nights. Okay, so this is beautiful, but we're gonna move. <laughs> Um, so yeah, basically uh, this is uh, the profile for several classes and as uh, uh, was said in the video, it's not only the distance, it's also the elevation. So 10,000, 10,000 uh, meters up and of course the same distance or the same uh, elevation down. Uh, so there are also uh, shorter uh, distances. Uh, so in total, uh, in the video they said uh, 6,000, now it's more clo it's closer to uh, 10,000 runners. So it's not that as big as the big uh, London, Paris, New York marathon, but still it's a fair number of people. So it's quite popular now. Um, so in Ultra Trail, there is a uh, harder than the Trail du Mont Blanc or the 100 miles in the US. Uh, and uh, in Ultra Trail, probably the toughest race is, is called the Tour des Géants in Italy. And here you have the distance and the elevation. So 330k and 24,000 uh, meters of uh, positive and negative elevation. So it's basically three times climbing the Mount Everest, so not, not much. Um, 
And as you can see, it goes from 300 to uh, 3,000 something meters of, of altitude. But the, the altitude is actually not so much a problem because you are only passing the, 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 the passes and then going down. So it's not staying at altitude. Okay, so in endurance running, or in, yeah, endurance and endurance running, the, the main uh, determining factors of performance are well known. So of course there are more than that, but the, the main ones are U2 max, as everyone knows. Uh, the fraction of U2 max you can maintain over the distance, which is basically one possible definition of endurance. And it also depends on your efficiency, so the energy cost of running. Uh, in neutral endurance, might be a bit more complicated. Of course, we can find again the three uh, main parameters like uh, <coughs> neutral mass. Yeah. Okay, so neutral max. Uh, endurance. Here we are talking about the low intensity endurance. Uh, you see a difference. And energy running and walking energy cost. So the, the three main parameters, but as you can see, it's uh, more complicated than in like a normal endurance, like a marathon. First of all, running, it's not only running at a given pace, so there are various terrain, various uh, slopes, um, and it's not only running, it's running and walking. There are other differences like, um, <coughs> the, of course, this is important in all endurance events, but it's probably even more important, and I'm sure the next uh, speaker will talk about that, the psychological motivational factors are even probably more important in neutral endurance and in normal endurance uh, um, events. The equipment is, more, is uh, probably more tricky, the tactics, logistics is more important in neutral endurance. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. The muscle damage, the lower limb tissue damage is also one factor that could differentiate endurance and endurance. So it's overall, I think it's uh, more complicated if you want. And uh, also that's probably why I like that so much. It's more interesting to, to my opinion. Um, so let's talk about uh, this uh, energy cost. Uh, I'm not going into detail on the different determining factors of energy cost of uh, running. <coughs> I just want to uh, emphasize a few, and you'll, you'll understand why in a minute. So among the factors that are very important to have a low, which means a good energy cost of running, are obviously the uh, leg diameter and mass, and that's probably one reason why the Eastern African runners are so good. Um, flexibility. you may want to have a quite low flexibility, at least for some muscles, if you want to have a good energy cost of running. Uh, of course, technique is important, especially the neuromuscular aspect of running. And the equipment, of course, if you run, you just want to have the lightest possible equipment. Okay? We'll go back to those uh, factors later. Um, Low intensity endurance is the second <coughs> very important factor. Uh, VO2 max is also important, even for very long ultra endurance events. VO2 max is, is still important. But uh, I'm going to talk about uh, endurance now. So basically, and this is of course very schematic, uh, I tend to differentiate so distance like a marathon, half marathon, 10K, I will call that high intensity endurance compared to endurance that is needed for ultramarathon, and which is the low intensity endurance. And of course there are again, there are many other factors, but basically what is very important to have a good endurance for that type of event is to have a high, an average threshold, make sure that you start the race with uh, uh, your glycogen stores completely full. And uh, that's, that's very important. Now if you're doing an ultra endurance event, this is not, uh, this is not that important. I think there are two main Factors that are very typical to low intensity endurance uh, that you need in your endurance is the ability to eat over the distance without being sick, without nausea, without gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, and so, in, in high intensity endurance, yeah, you really need to know exactly, uh, you need to start with a high glycogen store, you need to take glucose at a step. This is very uh, almost scientific nutrition here. And you, because, uh, as you can see here, if you run a marathon, so you're about at this probably intensity, 70 to 80 percent, 85 percent of your U2 max, this is where the, the glycogen depletion occurs. In ultra 
we are here. We are running, if you run with the Scouting Mont Blanc, if you're good, you will probably run at 50% of your uh, VO2 max. So, as you can see, obviously, the glycogen depletion is much lower. So, glycogen depletion is not a problem anymore, or not as much. But this is a problem. Obviously, the gastrointestinal symptoms can occur in much shorter distances, like a marathon. And you probably have seen this nice picture before. But this is even a bigger issue in ultramarathon. So this is really your friend if you're running a, an ultramarathon. Um, so this is one very specific factor in ultramarathon. And the other important factor that is uh, less or not true in, in shorter distances is your capacity to resist to learning tissue damage. Um, this is a graph showing the CK. Uh, and we agree it's not a, a very good uh, presentation of uh, tissue damage, but still, this is one index. So creatin kinase, and the, so the evolution of creatin kinase for over 24 hours run. So this is one study we did uh, a couple of years ago when we had 12 runners running 24 hours on the treadmill and we took blood every <coughs> four hours and we did other neuronal measurements. I will show you the data later on. So every four hours we took blood and this is the CK change. So as you can see, there are two groups of subjects. So basically, those guys stay relatively low in CK. This is still a high. I mean, 5,000 units for CK is, is already a high uh, concentration. But this is nothing compared to those guys. Um, as you can see here, those guys are going up to 40,000, which is a lot. And same thing here after <coughs> the threshold of Mont Blanc. Um, come on. There we go. After the Trochel de Mont Blanc, you can see, so this is a different subject. This is the CK change before and after the Trochel de Mont Blanc. And you can see that those guys in green are okay, but the, the four, for instance, in, in red, they are going up to 50, these two guys is up to 50,000. So this is a lot. And basically, so for the, those two studies, the UTMB one and the 24 hour treadmill one, the, the average CK increase was that, but the, which is probably more important is the, the variation, the standard deviation of these numbers. As you can see here, it's, it's very high. So there is a huge variability among runners in their uh, CK increase, so more or less the, in the, the muscle uh, damage probably. So yeah, this is clearly a very important one. So if you're able to, to resist to those damage and you can train for that, there will probably be an innate part of uh, everything. But uh, this is clearly an advantage. So because this is an important factor for high intensity and uh, low intensity endurance, and because low intensity endurance is obviously a factor of performance, you may want to <coughs> emphasize that. You may want to try to minimize those damage. So now if we talk about economy, we can talk about obviously energy economy. So basically running economy, uh, energy cost of running I was talking about. But you can also talk about economy of your leg tissue. And if you think like that, basically sometimes you have to choose between the two. <coughs> okay? So for instance, technique, try frequency. You know that if you want to save energy, we know that you have to run at your preferred try um, uh, frequency. However, if you want to save your tissue, you may want to overstride, to run at a higher frequency. Okay? Uh, same thing, the type of foot strike. Uh, we can discuss hours about that, but uh, uh, most of the time people with a poor <coughs> or mid foot strike are, have good uh, energy cost of running. But in, if you, in, in ultramarathon, you may want to be more of a foot striker. Shoes. Yeah, for sure, if you're in a marathon, you may want to have your, and if you want to have a good energy cost of running, you need lighter shoes, light shoes. Uh, in ultra marathon, you may want some more protective shoes. Falls. Of course, who is going to run a marathon or a half marathon will fall? This, this is going to be stupid. You are just carrying more weight. In ultra marathon, falls in ultra trail. In particular, falls can be very uh, important, very efficient, because, well, not efficient in terms of energy, but you are carrying more weight, so your energy cost of running is, is, is deteriorated. But however, you can, because you put uh, force on the pole, you're going to save a lot of it. You're, you have to, you're going to reduce the muscle activity, your leg muscle activity, 
and you can also use that to downhill to again to save your, your legs. Um, so same thing for flexibility. As I said, flexibility might be uh, better uh, uh, negative for energy cost of running, but some studies have shown that if you're more flexible, you're going to, to reduce uh, the, the damage of eccentric exercise. Uh, so, that, so there are not much data, but there are enough to <coughs> at least think about that. Um, same thing for uh, muscle mass. I'm not saying that if you want to run an ultra marathon, you have to have big muscles. But for sure, if you are, if you want to have a good energy cost of running, you clearly need muscles like that. And as I said, this is probably <coughs> the reason why the Eastern African are good because look at their muscles. <coughs> okay. And now this, uh, this is the muscle for the best ultra trail runners. So clearly, there is a difference. There is also a difference of level, to be fully honest. Those guys are not as good as those guys, okay? But still, look at the muscles here. This, this is not, we're not talking about the same sport, right? So if you are like that, you definitely need to, to choose ultra endurance rather than marathon, because those guys have absolutely no chance on 10K half marathon marathon. But in ultra trail, they can perform well, because this higher Muscle mass can help them in, in downhill, so they have to have m more muscle tissue can be not an advantage, but at least not as negative as in uh, uh, faster running. And this is uh, due to just basic biomechanics analysis, because the, the speed is lower, so the frequency is lower, so that inertia is lower. So if you have more uh, muscle mass, this is not as bad in ultra endurance as in uh, faster uh, distance uh, endurance. Time. So yeah, that's why we published this viewpoint uh, a couple of years ago, uh, saying that yeah, you may want to sacrifice running economy in ultra to improve performance. So yeah. So in other words, because you are able, if you do that, to increase the low intensity endurance, you are able to increase the maximal power you can sustain over the race. So even if you lose a bit for that. Since you are uh, improving this factor, maybe the total performance can be improved. So at least, again, this is a food for thought. OK, so if we talk about uh, endurance and uh, low intensity endurance, in that case, endurance can also be defined as the capacity to resist to fatigue. So now we're going to talk about uh, fatigue a little bit. So what is fatigue? And again, we can talk for hours about fatigue, but uh, as an exercise physiologist, and I'm, uh, I'm sure I will not be the only one in this room uh, defining fatigue as a reduction of maximal force. So basically, you're sustaining a, a given speed or percentage of your maximal voluntary contraction, so a target force, and you're measuring uh, maximal force, and you are going to observe a decrease with exercise. You are going to measure a decrease of maximal force. And this is one possible definition of fatigue, a decrease of maximal capacity, either force or maximal power or whatever. So this is fatigue. And this is different to exhaustion, because exhaustion, yeah, you're not able to sustain the task. So this is, I would call that exhaustion. But here, you are still able to uh, sustain the task, but you're still fatigued because your maximal force is lower than at the beginning, okay? So very simple. So now, a bit more complicated is, uh, okay, we are uh, losing force or strength, but why? Uh, and in particular, oh, sorry, sorry, before that, okay, so this is the general definition of fatigue. So how is fatigue in, in running and endurance running and ultra endurance running? So if we talk about strength loss as a as a definition of fatigue, there are, we published with uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Romeo de Perse, this paper uh, a few years ago, uh, which has been actually uh, quite cited. I checked yesterday and there was a quite a fair number of citations. Uh, so, which is where, where we presented the, the fatigue, so basically uh, the knee extensors uh, strength loss as a function of the duration of the race. And it looks like there is a, it's not a linear increase, it looks like there is this non-linear increase tending to a plateau. But obviously, we, at that time, we didn't have much uh, data for longer uh, duration 
races. So that's why I decided to, uh, to do a couple of uh, experiments in long distance or longer distance uh, running. And what we, so we did uh, that, as I said, for the 24 hours in front, and we observed. <coughs> so this is the knee extensors. This is the plantar flexors muscle. <coughs> this is a decrease of force. So we measure force again every four hours, and we observe a decrease of uh, force for both knee extensors and plantar flexors, as expected. But the the, the inter interesting information is, is here. So the, the the change, total change, is minus 40%. For knee extensor, a bit less for plantar flexor. So minus 40% if we want to keep the quad. And same thing for the Ultra-Trail du Mont Blanc. So still knee extensor, plantar flexors. So for the real race, the total race, which was 155K, 10,000 meters of elevation, <coughs> actually the, the, the fatigue was not higher, minus 35%. And for plantar flexors, it was a bit higher, minus 40% here. And we also measure recovery in that, in that uh, study. So two days, five days, nine days, and 16 days after the race. And as you can see, there is um, the, a kind of uh, exponential recovery here. Like two days after the race, <coughs> the subjects were back to minus 10% compared to the initial value. And basically 16 days, so a bit more than two weeks after the race, they were back almost to normal, uh, to initial values which doesn't mean that they, were, they, they fully recovered. They, it means that they were able to produce the same amount of force. So showing that recovery is probably more than force uh, uh, production capacity. Anyway, so minus 35%. And when we did the second study, still at the ultra 12 Mont Blanc, it was a shortened version because of uh, weather uh, issues. Uh, but still 110 kilometers and 6,000 meters of elevation, so still a reasonable return event. Uh, and uh, interestingly, it was not, uh, even if it was shorter, as you can see, the, the strength loss was about the same. So basically, if we go back to, uh, to the, the initial uh, graph showing fatigue in function of duration, now we have more point here, and we confirm that there was a kind of plateau uh, showing that, yeah, probably around 35, 40%, at least for the knee extensor muscle, there is a plateau, and if you go uh, for longer distances, you're not going to increase your fatigue. And actually, if you're going for much longer distances, you're not only going to not increase your fatigue, but you're going to reduce the fatigue. And because we did a study at the Tour des Géants, and in that study, we observed that not only it didn't increase, or but it didn't even stay at the same level. The reduction of force here after the Tour de Gien, which is basically twice the Trotel du Mont Blanc, was only 25%. So basically what we have is something like that. So now we are here. Okay? Can I turn on the, on the wall? <laughs> okay, so we have a point here now. Okay? <laughs> and so that was uh, quite publicized in, 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 the, in the, the newspapers or magazines because basically what people uh, Think about that is okay. So if I run 200 miles, I'm less fatigued than if I run 100 miles. <laughs> okay, right. now we can try to explain why we are fatigued in, in running. And of course, as you know, there is a task de de dependency of, of fatigue. So depending on the, the type of exercise you are doing, the cause of fatigue, causes of fatigue can be uh, very different. So what about running? And ultra running. This graph is very uh, famous. It shows the different potential sites of fatigue, of uh, neuromuscular fatigue at least, uh, so from a big language sheet. And it shows that the, the different sites can be divided in central and peripheral uh, fatigue. So central fatigue is basically every cause above the neuromuscular junction and peripheral fatigue or muscle fatigue is beyond the neuromuscular junction. And I'm not going to detail that, but basically it could, go, could be any, anywhere from the motor cortex activation to the force production capacity at the cross bridge or level. Let's start with the central fatigue. 
So control fatigue can be defined. Control with my remote control. Um, central fatigue can be defined uh, depending if you're an exercise physiologist, a psychologist, there are different definitions of fatigue. So like subjective fatigue, FPE, rating a person of exertion can be a definition of, uh, of fatigue, of central fatigue. Uh, if you're a more motor control guy, you may define uh, uh, an alteration of the inter intermuscular coordination as central fatigue. Um, if you are more interested by the cognitive function, yeah, any alteration of this cognitive function can also be a sign of central fatigue. But again, as an exercise physiologist, defining fatigue as a reduction of maximal strength, our definition of central fatigue is a reduction of maximal voluntary activation. So you may be familiar with that or not. This is quite old now. But uh, just in case you are not in, in this field, um, I'm going to explain what maximal voluntary activation is. And again, keep in mind that central fatigue in that case is a reduction of this maximal voluntary activation. It doesn't mean that you, it's a low percentage per se. It's, it's just a reduction from the non-fatigue to the fatigue state. Okay? So basically, to measure voluntary activation, what we do is that we ask a subject to do a, a maximal voluntary contraction. Usually, it's an, in isometric mode. And we superimpose a stimulus here, like an electrical stimulus. In that case, it's to a, the femoral nerve. And what we observe here is the, the superimposed response here. So this is force, maximal force. And when the subject reaches the plateau, we superimpose the stimulus. And then we do the same thing when the muscles are fully relaxed. Okay, and we are measuring the, the so-called resting twitch. And we are comparing the superimposed twitch here to the resting twitch. And using this equation, this very simple equation, we're able to calculate a percentage voluntary activation. And again, any reduction is a sign of central fatigue. So how is voluntary activation in central, in um, ultra endurance? Here you have an example of the difference between, so that's a typical subject before and after the ultra trail du Mont Blanc. So this is EMG, but this is the force with the superimposed stimulation I was talking about. So there is uh, not much happening uh, on the plateau when we superimpose the twitch before the ultra trail du Mont Blanc. But as you can see here, of course, the force, total force is much lower. That's the definition of fatigue, reduction of maximal force capacity. But as you can see, the superimposed twitch here is much, much higher. So it means that there is a huge drop of voluntary activation. And this voluntary activation, we measure that. So that was uh, a few years ago, over a 65K uh, reduction of uh, 30%. This was probably overestimated because that, that was our first study with that. And we didn't uh, fully put on, well, ba basically, there were some methodological, is uh, methodological issues. But uh, still, a huge uh, central fatigue. Same thing for the 24 hours run. As you can see, the voluntary activation decreased a lot. Especially for knee extensors, uh, the voluntary activation decrease for plantar flexors was much lower, but still 15%. But here, there was a reduction of 30% of voluntary activation, which is a huge central fatigue. And again, for the ultra trail du Mont Blanc, we also observed a, a huge central fatigue. Not much for the plantar flexors for some reasons, but for the knee extensor, there was a 20% reduction of the basically of the central drive. So the voluntary activation decreased by 20%. By, uh, um, so, if we want to go a step further, we may want to ask, okay, so now we have a reduction of the central drive in fatigue condition after an ultra endurance event, but why? What's the central fatigue origin? And you probably know that it's not as simple as peripheral fatigue is in the muscle, central fatigue is in the brain. There is lots of interaction between, between the two, and it's actually quite complicated. Um, the reduction of central drive can be due to anything from the, an alteration of the motor neuron properties to a uh, change in afferent inputs and, of course, some real supraspinal uh, fatigue. So this one theory about uh, central fatigue, especially in endurance and ultra-endurance events, is that there, is, uh, uh, some, there are some changes at the, uh, at the, at the supraspinal le level and some uh, uh, neurotransmitter uh, uh, associated fatigue. So, and uh, one proposed uh, explanation that I'm talking as I, I know Roman is here in the room, so please go back to, uh, to his review and maybe there is uh, an updated one, I'm not too sure. But one hypothesis that has been discussed is that 
control fatigue in ultra endurance or endurance running or uh, endurance uh, can be related to an increase of this ratio so the free tryptophan <coughs> over uh, brain chain amino acid concentration which basically induce an accumulation of serotonin in the brain and that could be an explanation of uh, central fatigue um, so to try to test whether or not this is due to this uh, serotonin accumulation which is itself related to what happened in terms of a metabolism meaning that you are using brown chain amino acid as an energy source or you're using a free fatty acid meaning that the tryptophan is more in the free state leading to more tryp tryptophan in the brain and more serotonin in the brain uh, what we we did is we compare two events so same duration uh, same intensity but one with um, major peripheral damage of fatigue which is running and the other one with much less peripheral alteration which is in that case cross country skiing and what we observe is this is the voluntary activation change from before and after the race and in running so that was only a 30k so it wasn't an ultra marathon it was a, a trail running a classic trail running but we still observe a significant reduction of voluntary activation minus eight percent that was significant and there was absolutely no change in cross-country skiing so of course this is a very indirect uh, conclusion but if everything was related to what happened in terms of metabolism there is no reason that between those two events there was such a difference in terms of uh, reduction of voluntary activation and the same thing when we with Romeo Lopez when we compare running and cycling we always observed a much for a given intensity for instance we compare five hours running and five hours cycling and we always observe uh, and same intensity 55 percent of vo2 max and we al always observe a much lower reduction in voluntary activation in cycling compared to running so what happened at the periphery clearly impacts your reduction of central drive so there is really an interaction between the two another index showing that could be related to what happened at the periphery or the motor neuron level is the reduction of the Hoffman reflex uh, but this this reflex is imperfect so yeah it could be really a change at the motor neuron excitability or it could be pre-synaptic inhibition coming from type 3 and 4 uh, afferent fibers but what we concluded is that the central fatigue that we observe and the large central fatigue that we observe uh, after those very long uh, runs are not at least not totally due to central nervous system biochemical changes now what we want to do and we are starting a PhD program working partly on that is we try to have a better uh, assessment of the motor neuron excitability by doing some uh, cervical medullary uh, stimulations so maybe in the next conference I will come and present that again uh, to further uh, investigate the central fatigue, we also use, uh, in, during the second UTMB experiment, the TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, so we are stimulating the motor cortex and recording both the uh, EMG and false uh, production. And what we observe, uh, just in case you're not too familiar with TMS, again, a short video. Um, Showing the, the cerveau, Sorry, it's in French, but. Uh, so basically, what we do is we are also superimposing the twitch as we, we did with the femoral nerve stimulation, except that we are stimulating the, directly the, the motor cortex, but you can see the superimposed twitch here. And there are some metallurgical differences between the two, but it's not that important. Avec et sans stimulation, on met en évidence le rôle précis de la commande de la flux nerveux dans l'effort. Un autre mécanisme intervient pendant l'effort. Le corps envoie aussi des signaux de douleur au cerveau. Vous pouvez voir la contraction, la maximale contraction et la stimulation. So basically the same, same idea, except that we stimulate here. And as you can see, we observe uh, a reduction of the maximal voluntary contraction but this time measure with TMS in, in, in yellow so there is really some some kind of supra spinal component but still that can be related to what happened <coughs> at the periphery so what we can say from from that is that 
the brain is able to do more, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean that it's all located within the brain. When we stimulate, we also record EMG, and from there we can, so this is the EMG during maximal voluntary contraction, and w this is the stimulation, so we record this nice wave here, which is called a MET, motor evoked potential, and then there is a, a period without EMG, which corresponds to a silent period, so uh, nothing happening. And this, this is uh, an index of uh, cortical spinal excitability, so the MET change, and uh, the silent period is an index of uh, inhibition, uh, intracortical or not, we're not too sure, but some, some kind of inhibition. Uh, and what we observed is that after the race, there was no reduction of cortical spinal excitability. There was actually an increase. As you can see here, the MEP, the normalized MEP, increased uh, after the race uh, for both the rectus femoris and the vastus lateralis muscles. Um, so no decrease, there is even an increase of uh, excitability, and the cortical silent period didn't change. So basically, there is no change in, in, in the cortical spinal excitability, no change in inhibition of, if there is a change, it's, it's an increase rather than a reduction. So what is possible is that still the peripheral fatigue uh, can send some information acting at the spinal level that could, for instance, explain the decrease of uh, Hoffman reflex that I showed earlier, or it could be also uh, sending uh, inhibitory information at the, at the supraspinal uh, level uh, and inducing central fatigue. And when we're talking about the, the afferents from the periphery in fatigue, very often people talk about the type 3 and 4 afferent fibers and we know that those fibers are sensitive to different biochem biochemical changes like uh, acidosis, uh, extracellular potassium, or inflammation. So of course in, in ultraendurance we are thinking about uh, inflammation and there is definitely some inflammation. So this is for instance uh, an ankle after the, after the tour de géant. So there is basically some kind of edema as you can see. Uh, it's not an ankle strain, it's really just the, the normal inflammation after the race. It's a bit scary. Uh, other indirect evidence is the increase of body weight, uh, also related to edema two days after the race, after the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc, and more direct evidence as the is the increase of CRP after the race. So, but, uh, so there is a huge increase, but as you can see in the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc, we observed that two days after the race, CRP was still high, okay, so the inflammation was still there for sure, still the Voluntary activation was back to normal. So it's not like the inflammation triggered the type 3 and 4 front fibers which decreased the voluntary activation. It doesn't work like that. So, but it still can be the, the huge reduction of uh, voluntary activation can still come from the periphery. And there are many other afferent fibers that can explain this, like the disfacilitation of the 1A afferent can be, can be one ex potential explanation, but we don't have any argument for that. But it's still uh, possible. Okay, uh, so that was central fatigue and obviously it's not because there is a huge central fatigue that there is no peripheral fatigue and there, there is some peripheral fatigue. Uh, so to assess peripheral fatigue, we just compare the force production uh, before and after the, race, after the race, but when the muscles are in the relaxed state and there is clearly some peripheral fatigue. But as you can see, like for the 24 hours run, the, the, the change in, at the peripheral level was only 10% for the knee extensors. And same thing after the Fertile du Mont Blanc. So the, the reduction of the uh, stimulation, or the force produced by the stimulation on relaxed muscle, he, in that case, there was a doublet at 100 hertz. Uh, here was only minus 12%. So that was significant. Uh, more at the, at, uh, at the plantar flexor level, but still. Um, not much for the, we were talking about the knee extensors at least, uh, not much uh, happened in terms of peripheral fatigue compared to the central, the reduction in central drive. Um, one question that we had was, okay, can we observe some kind of low frequency fatigue after ultra endurance running? Because in case you're not familiar with low frequency fatigue, so 
This is a comparison of the force reduction at high and low frequency of stimulation. So in that case here, this is not ultra endurance, this is a downhill running, so very eccentric type of exercise. Uh, we observe a reduction of the force evoked by the high frequency tetanus by 20%. But now when we stimulate at a much lower frequency, 20 hertz, as you can see here, the reduction is much higher. So the reduction one in that case, in that study, uh, 50%. So that the ratio between 20 and 80 hertz uh, was decreased. And this is called low frequency fatigue. And this is usually associated with uh, excitation contraction coupling failure. So we wanted to know, because this is uh, associated with, with uh, eccentric exercise, and obviously in running there is accumulation of light eccentric contraction. So we wanted to know if this happened in, in running. And uh, in particular, this can be related to what happened at the T-tubule sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, interface. So the, there might be some kind of a mechanical uh, perturbation here inducing this uh, EC uh, failure. So what about prolonged, prolonged running exercise? This is the results, like for the 24 hours run, not much happening, so no significant change of this ratio. So both the 20 and the 80 hertz decreased but they both decrease to the same extent, so that the ratio between the two uh, didn't change. Same thing in that study that we published after a five hours treadmill, and same thing after a uh, four hours treadmill run uh, published by uh, Davis and Thompson a few years ago. So the only time we were able to, to evidence some kind of uh, low frequency fatigue immediately after the race was after the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc, probably because of this uh, downhill component. But uh, still, yeah, we really had to go as much as uh, uh, 160K with 10,000 meters downhill to observe the low frequency fatigue. And this is still much lower than doing 30 minutes downhill run at a much higher pace. So the, the, basically the conclusion of that is that the intensity of the eccentric contraction is much more important than the, the number of repetition of low intensity eccentric contraction, okay? Okay, so now women versus men. So no, this is not a representation of a woman versus men. We're just uh, <laughs> super happy to have uh, this study evidence in the in the ACSM uh, newsletter this week. So that's why I'm putting this. Uh, so we in the last uh, UTMB study we compare fatigue of uh, men versus women, and the idea being that again this can be discussed for years, but. Uh, some people, there are some evidence showing that a female might be a bit better in ultra endurance, like relatively speaking, obviously, uh, a bit better than men. So not, not in absolute, but relatively speaking, the higher the distance, the, the closer females are from, from males. It's, again, it's not that clear, but uh, at least there is some uh, anecdotal evidences showing that. And we wanted to know whether this is related to uh, a better resistance to fatigue. So we compare male and female with the same level of performance. In t again, the relative level of performance was the same, meaning that the, the finishing time was the, in percentage of the winning time for the male and female was the same. Uh, and we observed that at the knee extensor levels, the female had the lower fatigue. So the total fatigue was lower. And this was associated with tendencies for lower peripheral and central fatigue, but this was not significant. But the accumulation of these uh, factors, uh, we, uh, we observed a significant lower total fatigue for females. Um, that was published this year in MSSC. And the same thing for the plantar flexors. The, apparently, the, the peripheral fatigue was also lower for females. So there is something here. Um, at the end of the race, the females were, generally speaking, were a bit less fatigued than male. Now you have to realize that this is after a race. So it, it, it wasn't the same, like the same percentage view to max, same, percent, same intensity, same duration. Uh, you have to realize that they, of course, this was the, 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 they were able to pace themselves. So it could be that either they are more resistant to fatigue or they have a more protective approach, female. Could be both, right? So, but still, the results are here at the end of the race. They tend to be less fatigued than, than males. Same thing with that, okay. Okay, so we started late, so I still have a few minutes, right? <laughs> so five minutes, okay, I'm dealing with five minutes. Just wanted to quickly uh, 
finish by asking this question. Okay, nice. I'm super happy. Nice data about central and peripheral fatigue. But is this very relevant for performance? Um, no, I don't think I, I have to admit not so much because even if we have this huge fatigue after a neutron marathon, you still okay, I'm losing 40% of my maximal force. Is that the explanation why my pace, my speed is reduced? No, because you're still below, like if, even if you still have 60% of your MVC, when you run and walk at that low speed, you, you're still way below that, that. So it's not directly related for sure. So it's not, no, it's not directly related to neuromuscular fatigue. So to try to relate the, the work I do in uh, neuromuscular fatigue and performance, I try to, 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 uh, to publish this uh, model. Uh, the flush model. So we published that in uh, sports medicine. Part of it was for fun, obviously, but not, not only. Uh, so basically, I don't have time to explain, but uh, as uh, many model is in this domain, it's related to, to RPE, which is associated with the lower, uh, level of uh, water in the, in the flush. Um, and so RPE increased with exercise. That could be due to the neuromuscular fatigue I was explaining. Uh, either feedback mechanisms or feed-forward mechanisms associated with peripheral fatigue, meaning that you need more central drive to, well, this is uh, some, it will, it will explain uh, some things. Uh, but of course, this is not only, and this is, I guess, the main interest of this model, that this is not only related to, to the neuromuscular alteration, but this model can also explain what some people have talked yesterday, the, the RP obviously is affected by many, many other things like feelings, sleep deprivation, mental fatigue, uh, the environment, for instance, can also uh, explain why RPE is, uh, is higher. Uh, and this is, uh, I don't have time to show that, but uh, that's evidence, nicely evidenced by Aman, for instance, in, in that paper. I'm going to skip that because we are late. Uh, but basically, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. And this is a, a nice, uh, I hope, at least a nice integrative approach uh, using this model that can integrate all those different aspects, explaining this time and using the numerical fatigue to explain the performance reduction and, and, and pacing. Uh, anyway, the conclusion and the, the main thing about this uh, model is that we have a security reserve, meaning that uh, we, are running, we are rarely running to death. Uh, I guess you can admit that. Um, so, which means basically that our brain protects ourselves against our own excess, at least acute excess, even if you are crazy enough to do those ultra marathons. Uh, events, at least almost always, because there are some cases or, or where our brain doesn't play its protective role. Mm. If you take drugs, for instance, if you take uh, stimulants or painkillers, uh, that might be problematic. Uh, in the heat, that can be problematic. The brain cannot play its role of a protective the body. Uh, like evidence in this uh, sauna contest, uh, you may have heard about that. So, well, I guess you can guess the, the idea to stay as long as possible in the, in the sauna. And apparently, it didn't work. The brain didn't play its role in that case. And the third, um, I think the third con condition I see where the brain can also not playing uh, not play its role is in uh, severe uh, sleep deprivation. Um, this is the Tour de Gien again, and this is uh, what happened to a, a guy that I know very well, super nice guy, smart, very handsome guy, uh, I'm not sure who you, you know I'm talking about, uh, but this guy slept less than three hours, so basically me obviously, I slept, I, when I did the race, I slept less than three hours in 87 hours in, uh, over the race, and the total duration of the race was 87 hours. And I can tell you that at some point, so you see, at, at the end of the race, I wasn't too sure if I was running or if I was dreaming. So sleep deprivation is not good. I can tell you that. I have this experience now. And this guy um, here, Stefan Poulot, he did the same race the year after. And he was about the same time. So I can really feel uh, what he was feeling. Uh, he even probably uh, slept less than me. Uh, you can see here, so this is the ultimator trace. And you can see here, he stopped here for about half an hour. He stopped, uh, where is it, uh, here, less than one hour. I'm not even sure he slept the whole uh, time here. 
you also needed to uh, to eat. So probably he slept like w half of what I was sleeping, so one hour and a half. And look what happened here. At some point, so it was almost done. So this is the different uh, uh, checkpoints. And this is him at the bottom here. And this is the finish line. So he was almost done. He, he had one, probably one hour less than two hours to go. He was third, so that also explains why he was so motivated and why he didn't sleep much, because he was third for him, that was a huge achievement. Uh, but at some point, he was so close, he was just unable to do a single further step. He just uh, was just lying on the ground, and he was lucky enough that he was not, uh, the weather was good, he was not in the mo alone in the mountain, because that could have been a fatal issue, for sure. Uh, so he, now he's okay, but uh, it's very rare that people are not able to, to really do an, another, another step. And that happened probably because of the sleep <coughs> deprivation. So in, in, again, this is probably the, the third condition when the, the brain doesn't play its uh, protective role, uh, very severe sleep deprivation that can occur in a very long ultra endurance even. Uh, probably the same thing in race across America. When you do 100 miles, this is not that this is not long enough, but when you start to do races like the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc, the, the Tour des Géants, sorry, 200 miles, that can, that can uh, uh, happen for sure. So, yeah, this is, uh, can, can be very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you.